everyone for being back. Thank you everyone for being back uh, promptly. We're going to continue our session on oligogenetics and epigenetics after two spectacular talks. We have two more coming. The uh, next presentation will be <clears throat> by Josh Dubnow, retrotransposons and endogenous retroviruses as causal factors in ALS and related diseases. Just briefly, uh, Professor Dubnow is in the Department of Anesthesiology at Stony Brook, also a member of the Departments of Neurobiology and Behavior. Uh, he uh, has a uh, international renown for his study of uh, mobile transposons and their role in normal aging and as well in brain disorders such as ALS and FTD. And we're just delighted uh, that you can join us today, Josh. Over to you. Thank you. So I'd like to thank all of the organizers for inviting me to take part in this great meeting. Um, I've already enjoyed fantastic talks and learned quite a lot. Um, I also want to express my sadness that we're not able to gather in a room together, um, but obviously I think that was the right decision to hold this meeting virtually. <laughs> so um, it's a pleasure to tell you um, some of the work in my lab. What I'd like to do is sort of introduce the topic um, and then tell you mostly an unpublished uh, story. Um, so, you know, as you're all aware, one of the most mysterious aspects of neurodegenerative disorders generally, and, and of ALS in particular, is the apparent um, onset that appears to be focal, localized, followed by a progressive spread. Um, and you know, the, the idea has emerged in the literature that this involves aggregation pathology of various proteins, depending on which disorder is cartooned on this slide, followed by the propagation through the tissue. Now, there are two basic ideas out in the literature for how this might take place. They are not mutually exclusive. The first idea is a selective sensitivity of different brain regions to the appearance of the pathology, which would lead to the apparent spread from brain region to brain region without actually having a non-cell autonomous aspect to it. And the other idea, which again is not mutually exclusive with the first, is that these misfolded aggregated proteins actually move from cell to cell leading to a propagation that is analogous to what has been proposed for prion disorders, although it's important to state that there's not really any evidence that uh, disorders such as Alzheimer's or frontotemporal dementia or ALS have any infectious um, um, features to them, but rather that there would be a transmission from cell to cell. And so um, I'm gonna focus on pathology of a protein called TDP43, which has already been mentioned. The um, aggregation of TDP43 and its appearance in inclusions in the cytoplasm um, is seen in about 97% of ALS subjects in postmortem tissue. Um, the degree of this pathology, meaning the number of cells appears to vary from patient to patient, but some degree of TDP43 proteinopathy is seen in almost all ALS patients. And this is true regardless of whether the patient has a sporadic or familial um, history and, and occurs in most types of genetic forms of ALS. And as I said, is seen in both neurons and glial cells. Now, the idea that is out there in the literature that has gained some traction is that this apparent um, focality and spread of the, path of, of the, um, of the neuropathology um, involves spread of misfolded seeds of this aggregated protein. And there are many reviews out there and primary publications that describe this as an idea. It's cartooned nicely on this review from Don Cleveland and colleagues. And you can see this character uh, uh, um, described for SOD1, as well as for a number of different aggregation prone proteins, including FUS and TDP43. And the idea is that a protein um, undergoes a misfolding event, and then catalyzes in trans the recruitment of other copies of that protein into larger aggregates, and that seeds of this aggregation can be released from one cell and taken up by a neighboring cell. And in principle, this could be neuron to neuron spread, it could be glial to glial spread, or it could be glial to neuron spread. And there's some evidence for this phenomenology, 
Um, this paper that I'm um, showing an example from um, in the fairly recent literature is probably one of the most striking examples of this phenomenology. Um, and this is work from uh, Virginia Lee and John Trojanowski's um, groups. What they did is to take um, purified seeds of TDP43 aggregates from front to temporal dementia patients, grow those in a cell culture assay, and inject them into mouse cortex, and then using an antibody that pathologists have often used to reveal hyperphosphorylated TDP43, um, pathological TDP43 in postmortem tissue, they observed some evidence for this type of protein pathology, both at the site of injection and even in contralateral regions of cortex. Um, the idea being that neurons that project through the corpus callosum may spread seeds of this aggregation pathology into um, neurons that are downstream. Um, and this type of evidence is quite striking and convincing that the protein can move from cell to cell. But I think it's important to keep in mind that typically these experiments, these types of experiments are done in animals that transgenically overexpress often mutated forms of the protein that are prone to aggregation. And importantly, although the phenomenology is quite striking and, and I think an important phenomenology, um, we typically do not observe evidence for spread of the cellular toxicity leading to degenerative effects on the, in the recipient neurons or, or glial cells. And so what I would like to do is advance to you an idea that we in my lab call the retrotransposon storm hypothesis. And the idea here, just to state it, is that TDP43 protein aggregation pathology synergizes with the ongoing effects of normal aging to cause a loss of systems that the genome has that normally silence or stifle the expression of elements that are called retrotransposons and endogenous retroviruses, and I'll unpack that. And that this results in what we call a storm of retrotransposon and endogenous retrovirus expression and or replication with toxic cellular effects that lead to cell death. And we further postulate that this effect has a local onset or can have a local onset followed by spread through the CNS with a non-cell autonomous and self-amplifying toxicity. So what are transposons? What are retrotransposons? What are endogenous retroviruses? These mobile elements come in two categories. The first, which were discovered by Barbara McClintock studying um, corn, um, are called cut and paste elements. These are pieces of DNA that code for a protein or proteins that carries out a recombination reaction to cleave the encoding DNA out of a chromos chromosomal location and paste it into a target location, a so-called cut and paste. This is not the type of transposable element that we're talking about. They're not thought to exist in the human uh, genome, it, not in functional form. Instead, we're talking about the second category that are called copy and paste or retrotransposon. These encode an RNA genome that is um, um, encoded by a sort of provirus that exists in chromosomal DNA. And that RNA genome codes for one or more proteins that bind to the RNA with a cis preference, carry it back into the nucleus and carry out a reverse transcription reaction and cleave chromosomal DNA leading to double strand breaks and insert the cDNA that's either synthesized there or in the cytoplasm, depending on the type of element, and copy a new copy into a de novo location. <clears throat> These retrotransposons actually are the evolutionary ancestors of all retroviruses, and they are sometimes called endogenous retroviruses, depending on whether they have um, the full functional machinery that a, ret re that a retrovirus would have. But retrotransposons come in several types. There are fully autonomous elements that encode all of the RNA machinery and the protein machinery to carry out their replication cycle. And there are non-autonomous elements that have the RNA motifs and their replication can be catalyzed by proteins that are supplied in trans by autonomous elements. 
There are millions of these non-autonomous elements in the human genome. There are about 500,000 of the so-called line elements in a human genome, perhaps several hundreds of which, of which may be fully functional. And then there are so-called long terminal repeat slash endogenous retroviruses that are the evolutionary cousins of exogenous retroviruses. And in humans, the most recently active one is called HERV-K. And I think the next talk, um, Avinath will talk a bit about HERV-K or I assume he will. Um, so as I said, these constitute a vast fraction of the human genome, um, approaching 40 to 50% of the DNA content. Most of these are not fully functional, but they may be expressed and may encode proteins. And as I said, a subset of them are fully replication competent. And generally speaking, when they are expressed, they are toxic. They can cause DNA damage leading to either senescence um, or, or apoptotic cell death. They can cause insertional mutations and their RNAs, the cDNAs they encode and the proteins that they encode can be toxic and in particular can lead to inflammatory signaling. So it's not surprising that our genomes, by our, I mean all plants and animals that have these, have, encoded, have, have evolved rather sophisticated and multi-layered multilayer, systems for silencing them. And these include chromatin-based silencing and um, Nancy Benini gave a nice talk about the chromatin level silencing mechanisms, which probably evolved in part to silence transposable elements. And then there are post-transcriptional silencing systems that involve small RNA mediated RNA cleavage or translational repression. Um, now, a literature has emerged over the past several years, including very nice work from Avi Nath's lab, from a number of other um, labs, as well as work from my own lab and from Molly Hamill's lab, um, some of which was done as a collaboration between Molly's lab and mine. And this literature has found correlations um, within a number of neurodegenerative diseases, including ALS and frontotemporal dementia, as well as more recent work on tau pathologies that demonstrate that in human tissues and in animal models and in cell culture, that these retrotransposable elements become overexpressed when we perturb function of TDP43, or as I said, of tau. So I wanna tell you a bit of an unpublished story about um, this, but I wanna first talk for a moment about how do we model TDP43 related neurodegeneration? The, the simple fact is there is no perfect model. Each approach has its own strengths and its own weaknesses. We can look at postmortem tissues and this type of analysis has the tremendous advantage that is physically relevant, physiologically relevant, it is the context of the disease, but we cannot control in a meaningful way the environmental variability, such as what we could do with cell culture or in an animal. We only observe the end stage and experimental work is not possible. IPS cells have tremendous advantages as have been mentioned, but are an oversimplified context that is devoid of a functioning neural circuit. Animal models with knock-in familial alleles may provide a wonderful opportunity to sensitize a genetic background in order to reveal upstream initiators, but these approaches typically yield mild phenotypic effects that don't typically lead to progression. And then there are overexpression models which um, are robust and they reproduce the loss of nuclear function of TDP43 they can reproduce the appearance of cytoplasmic inclusions, but they're a bit artificial and may yield artifacts. So with that context, I'm gonna tell you about an animal overexpression model, which again, with all, as with all of these approaches, comes with its strengths and its own weaknesses. And the model I'm gonna tell you about is in fruit flies. Um, and, I, and the points I wanna make are that when we overexpress TDP43, I think we may tap into um, a, um, a dysfunction in the autoregulatory control that may mimic what happens in diseased cells, that the loss of nuclear function may lead to a runaway expression of the protein, which may then lead to overexpression and further drive um, aggregation of the protein and inclusions in the cytoplasm. When we do this in Drosophila, as with many other animal models, we observe pathological cytoplasmic inclusions 
These are hyperphosphorylated. They lead to neuronal and glial toxicity and an age-dependent neurodegenerative effect. And these types of approaches have led to identify, identification of a wide array of functions and dysfunctions of TDP43 when it is perturbed. So here's an example of this in our Drosophila model. When we overexpress TDP43 in this place in glial cells, but it's true when we express it in neurons as well, we observe a loss of nuclear localization. So the green label is a hyperphosphorylated TDP43. This is human TDP43 expressed in a fly. Um, and this is using a phospho-specific antibody that many pathologists use on human tissue. And we see that it is cleared from the nuclei, which are labeled in blue, and accumulates in the cytoplasm. So we use the Swiss Army uh, knife-like genetic approaches of the fly. Um, there's a fast aging clock. So the age dependence is something that we can study rapidly in fruit flies. And when we have used this approach, we have previously found uh, uh, published that we disrupt the post-transcriptional silencing systems that normally keep retrotransposons in check. This leads to an upregulation of many different retrotransposable elements. And I'll focus on one here, which is, um, has been called Gypsy. There is a move to change the name of this element because this is considered to be an ethnic slur against the Romani people. So I will try to refer to it by its former name, which is MDG4. But I wanna first show you that um, what we're seeing in the fly is also seen in post-mortem tissue. Um, this was in collaboration with a number of colleagues, including Molly Hamill's lab, but this really was driven by uh, her group. And what she observed in post-mortem tissue from ALS subjects is that a substantial fraction of them, the postmortem motor cortex from a substantial fraction of them was defined by overexpression of retrotransposons, much as we had observed in the fruit fly. And in fact, this subset of tissues were the ones that had the greatest degree of TDP43 proteinopathy. So I suspect that this is the subset of ALS that we are modeling when we drive overexpression of TDP43 in fruit flies. Now in flies, we can establish causality here. When we overexpress TDP43, we dramatically shorten lifespan. This is now using glial expression. And if we knock down the MDG4 retrotransposable element, we have this remarkable extension of lifespan, not quite out to the levels of median survival of wild type animals, but a substantial effect. And in fact, we established in this 2017 paper that much of this toxicity had to do with activation of DNA damage sensing mechanisms through CHECK2. When we knock down CHECK2, we trick cells, we believe, into staying alive and repairing their damage instead of undergoing apoptosis. And we have this remarkable um, amelioration of the toxicity of TDP43. And at that time, we proposed the idea that perturbing TDP43 function led to the activation of these mobile elements, driving DNA damage and activating this CHECK2 signaling pathway leading to apoptosis. And um, in a paper that we published a few years ago, um, Yung Heng Chang, a very talented postdoc in my lab, established that, that even focally inducing TDP43 overexpression, for example, in a cluster of glial cells, leads to a non-cell autonomous toxicity that kills nearby neurons. So these neurons are labeled with this white marker, which is a marker for activated caspase-3, suggesting that they are on a path for apoptotic cell death. And he was able to establish that while overexpressing TDP43, if he simultaneously knocked down the expression of MDG4, that he could not only rescue the demise of these astrocytes, but he could prevent the, near, the death of nearby neurons. And this was also true if he knocked on expression of the CHECK2 DNA damage sensing pathway. Um, and at that time, we proposed the idea that focal induction of TDP43 proteinopathy in glial cells led to activation of this DNA damage sensing pathway led to activation of transposable elements 
which may cause a feedback cycle of DNA damage and retrotransposon activation, and that some toxic factor was released causing the death of nearby neurons. We at that time didn't know if this was an inflammatory response, if it was movement of cytoplasmic inclusions of TDP43 as seeds, or whether it was actually movement of retrotransposable elements. And what I want to do is tell you a bit of an unpublished story now that gets that begins to get at the mechanisms. So this is again work um, done by a postdoc in my lab, Dr. Cheng. He's on the job market, hire him. He's fantastic. So what he did here is to create a situation where we have a humanized fly that has TDP43 of humans knocked in to replace the fly gene. This fully functionally um, um, rescues. It's a flag tagged version. The animals have normal physiology and lifespan. They have no evidence of nerve degeneration and no evidence of TDP43 proteinopathy. He can detect the flag tag in neurons with a, and I'm gonna show you images that detect this in a cyan color. On that background, he induced cell type specific overexpression of human TDP43 focally just in one subset of Drosophila glial cells called SPG. And when he does this, he observes pathological TDP43, phosphor, hyperphosphorylated, including cytoplasmic puncta. And then he can assay what happens to neighboring neurons. So he, we're gonna show you pictures from a little um, stack of images in, the, in this part of the brain. There are glial cells that are cartooned in red, including these SPG that are on the surface. There are neuronal cell bodies nearby that will be marked in blue. And so you can see the neuronal cell bodies here. This is the knocked in humanized TDP43 that is flag tagged, expressed essentially in all nuclei. This is normal physiological levels expressed under the endogenous fly promoter. And he sees no evidence for hyperphosphorylated TDP43 when he does this. But upon this background, when he induces higher levels of human TDP43 in these surface glia called SPG, he observes that seven days after induction, there are cytoplasmic puncta that appear to be at some distance from this glial cell, probably in neuronal cytoplasm. There's low levels, and this is hyperphosphorylated TDP43, low levels are also detected in neuronal nuclei at some distance from the glial cell. And if you zoom in, you can see that there are also cytoplasmic puncta within the glial cells. If you look closely at the individual neurons that have begin to have hyperphosphorylated human TDP43 at some distance from the glia, they invariably begin to lose the flag tag. So the endogenous humanized flag tagged TDP43 is becoming depleted from the nuclei. And you can see this um, at higher magnification here. Now this propagation requires the presence, presence of the knocked in humanized allele that is expressed within the glial cells. And this is even more dramatic when we look 15 days after induction. Here we are inducing high levels within this glial cell. We see pretty massive accumulation of hyperphosphorylated TDP43 within the cytoplasm of the surface glial cell. And we also begin to see much stronger levels of accumulation at some distance from the glial cell within nearby neurons. And what I wanna tell you is that this propagation of pathological TDP43 from the glial cells to the neurons requires expression in the glial cells of this MDG4 endogenous retrovirus. So again, this is hyperphosphorylated TDP43 induced in the surface glia. We see it appearing in nearby neurons and nearby glial cells, I should say, when we knock down expression of MDG4 just within the glial cell where we're inducing high levels of TDP43, we see a tremendous amelioration of the propagation of hyperphosphorylated TDP43 to the nearby neurons. Now from these experiments alone, we cannot determine whether the appearance of TDP43 uh, uh, proteinopathy in neurons 
involves movement of path pathological seeds of TDP43 from the SPG glia to the neurons. It could be movement of, the, of seeds of TDP43, or it could be release of any toxic factor that is impacting the neurons in order to, to reinitiate um, the, the cycle of pathology. But we do know that it requires the presence of human flag tag TDP43 to be expressed within those neurons. And we know that it requires the MDG4 endogenous retrovirus expression within the SPG. And I want to advance the idea to you that the viral ancestry or evolutionary relationship of these retrovir endogenous retroviruses and retrotransposons may be important. So um, we previously published a reporter system that turns on nuclear cherry and membrane GFP. What, not when this endogenous retrovirus is expressed, but when it is expressed, goes through an RNA intermediate, copies into a cDNA, and reinserts into a de novo chromosome location. And we can detect those events by turning on these fluorophores. Um, and Richard Keegan, a former PhD student in my lab, did an experiment in cell culture where he, he transfected this reporter of MDG4 replication into donor cells. The expression of the reporter depends on the presence of these yeast transcription factor GAL4. So he transfected a, sep a separate population of cells with GAL4. He cultured them separately, washed them and mixed them, and found that indeed the reporter can transfer from these donor cells into the recipient cells, leading to expression of these two fluorophores. And he found that this was a viral replication mechanism. It could occur between populations of cells that were not grown in contact, but had um, a membrane with a 0.4 micron filter that would not allow passage of cells. So he again detects movement of the reporter from the top well into the bottom well. And he established that this requires the presence of the ENV glycoprotein, which is the surface protein encoded by this endogenous retrovirus that permits its fusion with the recipient cell. And I wanna point out that this may not be a fluke observation of this fruit fly endogenous retrovirus. In fact, it may be an ancient core property of retrotransposons. There is a report that human line one retrotransposons are able to move between cells and culture via um, an extracellular ve vesicle-like mechanism. The human endogenous retrovirus K, when reconstituted as a construct and transfected into cells, can form virus-like particles and move between mammalian cells grown in culture. And so I wanna propose the idea that we now need to test, which is that TDP43 aggregation pathology and aging synergize to cause activation of mobile elements such as retrotransposons and endogenous retroviruses, and that their expression and replication has toxic cellular effects, that this can lead to an, a local onset, and that the expression of these elements may help spread this pathology through tissue in a non-cell autonomous way. And um, I'll, I'll just say that the evolutionary relationship of these elements to viruses raises the intriguing idea that their ability to spread their genetic material between cells may help mediate the propagation of TDP43. And I wanna say that this does not necessarily require a fully functional virus. It merely requires an endogenous virus that forms a virus-like particle that taps into this viral-like mechanism of releasing virus-like particles that fuse to a recipient cell and transmit genetic material such as an RNA. Um, so I'll end there, and I wanna highlight that uh, the unpublished story that I told you about was done um, by Yongheng Cheng, who we call forever, a fantastic postdoc in the lab, who, as I said, is on the job market. And I also told you about the PhD work of Rich Keegan, um, a former PhD student in the lab. And I'm happy to take questions.
Thank you very much. That's very, very, very striking. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Are retrotransposable elements able to stimulate endogenous innate immune PRRs in neurons and microglia? Um, it's a question. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So um, there's, there's a wealth of evidence that retrotransposons and endogenous retroviruses may stimulate the innate immune system. And there are really um, several steps at which they could do that. One is that there's evidence from John Sidivi and others that, um, that cytoplasmic cDNA accumulation can activate the CGAS, uh, from these elements, may activate the CGAS sting pathway. There also is evidence that the RNA expression itself can activate through the RIG pathway and other, pa other um, mechanisms to activate the innate immune system. And then finally, it's worth saying that DNA damage also can be a signal that can lead to activation of these sorts of inflammatory mechanisms. So yes, I mean, that, that is one of our chief mechanisms here that, that we are considering and investigating. Thank you. Um, then, then the question is asked, is, is this exosome-like? I'm not sure I quite understand that, but let me throw that out. Yeah, so, so there's evidence from a publication with human line element in cell culture that it may transfer between cells through conditioned medium by an exosome, an extracellular vesicle, at least, like mechanism. There is evidence that RNAs from some of these mobile elements can be detected in extracellular vesicles. But then a subset of these elements, such as MDG4 in flies and HERF-K in humans, are actually evolutionary cousins of exogenous retroviruses that may form virus-like particles on their own. They even encode a glycoprotein that presumably would mediate fusion through a cellular receptor mechanism. Interesting. Finn Biao Gao asks, do you, have you overexpressed TDP43 in neurons and seen spread to other neurons or glia? In other words, the kind of the reverse of the experiment yeah. described. This, this is a great question. Um, um, we, we are beginning to do those experiments. Um, um, Finn Bell will, will appreciate that there is some fly challenge there because everything was in the GAL4 system. Um, we have now successfully made LEX-A mediated expression um, uh, systems for TDP43 that are functional so we can drive neuronal expression of that and then monitor our reporters and that sort of thing in glial cells with the GAL4 system. Uh, we have some interesting tidbits, but no real story there yet. But yeah, we're interested in that. And then also neuron to neuron would be quite interesting to us and we don't have evidence there yet. Thank you. Uh, Avi Nath says, great talk. Do you know if the TDP43 aggregates will bind to the ERV RNA? Yeah, this is a great question. We're looking now. We don't have uh, solid evidence on that, but that's absolutely something we're looking at. Thank you. And then there's a comment from Johan Skolk, exosomes package HERV RNA sequences specifically. And then it says, Tumor microvesicles contain retrotransposon elements and amplified oncogene sequences as a comment. Yeah, yeah, it's a good comment. Yeah. yeah. I, I should say on, on, on the question Avi asked, I mean, Avi knows this, but the T in TDP43 stands for TAR. I mean, it's worth stating uh -huh. that TDP43 was first identified as a 43 kilodalton protein that binds to the HIV tar element. So that's just worth keeping in mind as an historical um, point. The, the question is that once it becomes an aggregate, can it still bind R? That's the question. Ah, uh, yeah, we don't know. I, it's a good question. I don't know. After the aggregation. Yeah. So I, I just have a very general question, which is if you look back uh, across evolution, uh, at, at animals with increasingly complex genome and genome structure. Do you see uh, a point at which the appearance of retrotransposons or transposable elements appear uh, in 
in, in tronic sequences. I mean, if the argument is that 70 or 80 percent of our genome is composed of these elements. And the question is, if you look back in evolution, is there a point at which one can see the appearance of such a high percentage of these uh, components of, our, of, our, of, of the geno genome in general? Yeah, I mean, I'm, pro I'm, I, I'm by no means an expert in the, in the evolution of these elements, but, but I, I will say that, you know, there are TY elements in yeast. Yeah. Um, so these are pretty ancient. Um, um, there are, you know, some plant species have, you know, 80% of their genome made up of retrotransposons. Um, and then there are some organisms that have a much smaller fraction of their content. And it's a really interesting question why that would be the case. But I don't, I'm not aware that there's one point in evolution at which they sort of appeared. Um, I mean, Herv K in particular, Avi might be able to speak to this better than I, Herv K is, is a human lineage, but there are relatives of Herv K in other primates. So I'm not sure that's a good answer to the question. It's, not, it's a bit outside my expertise. I mean, it's an interesting idea. The thing is that some people believe that we are all, we evolved from viruses in the first place. They were the original life forms, you know? And the fact that they are, uh, have a reverse transcriptase allows you to go from RNA to DNA. The earliest life form may actually have been an RNA. Mm -hmm. And so we keep accumulating them and we form more and more complex organisms. And that's how we've all evolved. You know? yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, my, my only other comment, and, 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 and you spoke to this uh, earlier, is, is that in every example where there has been successful transmission, of a, a, a putative prion-like protein to, to some host. The host has always had some form of genetic mutation which predisposes it to undergo pathological protein misfolding. Yep. You know, I, I, I agree with you. And if I, if I had to give you my bias, yeah. my bias, you know, and, and I, I'm not saying that I know this to be true, but my bias is that it's not um, prion it's not principally prion-like spread. I mean, PRP, as described by Prusner, is really quite different. You, you can take scrapey hamster, you know, purification, inject it into a hamster, th th that hamster gets sick, and you can culture that and inject, you can passage it. That's not true, as far as I know, as far as the evidence is for these disorders. Um, so rather, I think of it as a sequential um, a propagation, if there is a propagation, by sequential reinitiation of a toxic cascade. My bias is we have something here that is evolutionarily related to something genetic that spreads between cells, viruses. So, like, that's my bias. And, but, but, you know, as the saying goes, don't mistake my enthusiasm for my ideas with confidence that they are right. So, like, that's my bias. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I also very strongly believe that the propagation here is not protein only, it's protein plus RNA. Now. And uh, we have a lot of data. Unfortunately, I didn't include the slides here to suggest that that really is the case. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> on that note, 